Okay, um, you're very welcome to tonight's Ulster GAA webinar. On the topic tonight is developing resilience in youth players. Um, my name is Ryan Mellon. Um, I work for Ulster GAA as a performance and lifestyle officer. Um, tonight, what we'll look at, we have three main areas that we're going to look at. Um, firstly, we're going to identify what is resilience. It's a word that we hear more often. Nowadays, um, quite often I hear things about, you know, youths aren't as resilient as what they used to be and things like that. And people use the word, but I'm not 100% sure if they, if they realise exactly what the, what, what the word means. So we're going to have a look at that to start off with. Following on from that, we're going to look at times when our resilience is challenged. And I suppose that, that this is maybe more around the, the resilience needed around sport around playing Gaelic games rather than the resilience, I suppose, from the, the outside stressors in life. But I think the, the, the same strategies will apply when dealing with them. So that leads us on to, to the strategies um, that, that we, we can use as coaches and as parents to improve resilience. Tonight's workshop, it's probably, it's focused towards parents of youth players, but it's also focused towards clubs and, or sorry, coaches and clubs. So hopefully, everybody, our, the audience tonight can get something out of it. Okay, and so what is resilience? And I've got a definition here. Resilience is the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties or toughness. Okay, so I suppose in my job, you get to deal with people from other sports and quite often we, do, we, we meet up with coaches from, from Ulster rugby and, and soccer and quite often their coaches at the professional level talk about you know, resilience being nearly the number one thing that they look for whenever players are coming through their their pathways. You know, talent, I suppose, is great. Of course, talent will get you so far. But when it comes to the, I suppose, the end of the pathway and they're going into the the, the really serious senior professional sport, um, it's, I think it's, it's the resilience along with the talent, what they're looking for. OK, so I suppose resilience encompasses a lot of things. All right, so th this is quite small. I'll read them out for you here. So resilience is about overcoming setbacks. It's about grit. It's about having a steely character, the ability to withstand pressure, determination, having coping strategies, uh, having perseverance and a strong mindset. OK, so that's, I suppose, gives us a, a, a brief idea of, of what resilience is. OK, I'm going to direct you maybe to, to somebody who has done quite a lot of work in this area, and that's Anya McNamara. Um, Anya has done a lot of work down in DCU. She's done a lot of work with uh, some of the, I think, the development squads across with the FA in England. And uh, you can see from the title here, what, what Anya would recommend for, for any young player is that they need, they need trauma. They need that. Rocky. So what she's, she's talking about here is the pathway, whether it be just at club level or the pathway at county level to the development squads within GAA, that that road or that pathway, the players on it um, actually benefit from the bumps in the road or the trauma or the, the rocky road along the way, rather than things um, going very, very smoothly for them. If things go too smoothly for a player along that, that pathway or that youth pathway, when they get to senior level and they meet some of the, I suppose, the adversities, they don't, they haven't um, developed the coping strategies, they haven't dealt the skills to, to deal with those. Whereas the players who have been met with the adversities along that pathway, they've got the opportunity to, to grow, to develop the skills, to deal with the, the adversities, the injuries, the setbacks. And then when they get to the senior level, they've got those strategies or they've got that, I suppose, in their toolbox to use it once they meet those adversities again at senior level. So hopefully to, to maybe to explain it better, I've got three graphs here. And what Anya has asked players to do is to kind of plot on a graph their development on their pathway from starting out as a youth player to senior level. If you look at profile A, it's described as being disjointed and eventful. OK, so it starts off that th there's good progression. Then all of a sudden you can see there's, there's some bumps in the road. But the, the most significant thing is 
that the, the line is continuing to go up at the end. So this particular player has made it to senior level and they're continuing to excel or to continue to, to improve at senior level. Profile B is, is pretty similar. Um, there's one major hiccup and several minor ones. You can see it's, it's it, the lines growing well. All of a sudden, there's a bit of a, a bit of a hiccup or a setback. Maybe that's a long-term injury or something like that. There's a few more hiccups along the way, but again, the significant thing is that that player is still there at senior level and their their lines still going up. They're still improving. Um, profile C is slightly different. Okay, this probably is a player who has got everything easy the whole way up through the pathway. You know, under 15s, under 16s, under 17s, they're probably very, very talented and they've kept improving the whole way up. But all of a sudden you can see where the line ends. Okay, once they've got to the senior level, instead of improving, they're actually, I suppose the line's going down. And quite often what we see with players like this is that they, they, they don't, um, they don't um, excel at senior level and quite often that, that they'll drop out. Okay. Moving on, um, Anya's done some other work and she's she done a bit of interesting work with the players who describe as supers. These are the players who have made it to elite level. Okay, they're, they're kind of the, the superstars. Whereas the other group on the right hand side here that she looked at, she described them as the almost. They're the guys that maybe we talked about in the last group. The guys who had the smooth, um, trajectory the whole way up their, 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 their youth level sport but once they've got to the top they haven't actually made it okay so I, I, I'll start off here to describe or go through what what Anya ha, has discovered with the supers okay they, they've had a slow bumpy um, progression so the guys that have made it to the top the progression hasn't been you know overnight it's been slow there's been bumps along they almost are the guys who you know they've had the smooth ride. They're they're the guys who are then, you know, been deemed to be the next Michael Murphys or the next Conor McManus or Peter Canavans who or whoever it is. The supers, in terms of parents, they th their parents supported them well, encouraged them, but were separated parents. Now, what I mean by that is that they weren't divorced, but they were separated from the uh, the I suppose the the activity that their child was doing, or they were separated from the squads. That, that their child was, was in. So again, I suppose just to be clear on it, they were, they were supportive, encouraging, but I suppose in contrast to the almost, they almost would, would have had parents who had very high levels of interest and it was nearly the parents who were driving, I suppose, the, the player rather than the actual player themselves. In terms of coaches, what was significant was, was the supers, the guys who made it had strong coaches and I think that, that that's I'm sure there's a lot of coaches on today. you know and that, that's a lesson be, be always be strong always challenge your players demand high standards even if you know even if you're working with different talent levels still demand high standards for the level of player that they're at they almost would have identified that their coaches were, were vocal and supportive when things were going well but when things kind of when when, they, when the player was underperforming that was much less Characteristics of the supers, they, they had a very high personal drive um, and they actually some of them created their own bumps. So I'd imagine what, what that would be, creating your own bumps would be, a, take the example of an under 14 or an under 16 player, you know, going down to training and in the games at training, they're, they're scoring nine, 10 goals or whatever at full forward and they're really good at their first touch and taking their, their marker on and scoring goals and points. They might think to themselves, right, I need to develop in different areas. They might switch themselves out or ask to get played in defence or midfield and start to develop those other those other skills like tackling or you know, um, high field and things like that. That will stand to them later on in the pathway. Whereas they almost they were committed early and when things were going well and they had enjoyed the attention of being the the next superstar or the next big thing. Finally, the supers. Um, their personality was that they were very they had a positive reaction to challenges and setbacks and used use those as stimulus. Whereas they almost um, they had quite a negative reaction to challenges. You know, they would use things like why me when things go wrong or I'm so unlucky or it's not fair. Okay. So to sum up um, Anya's work, 
I think what, what she's recommending is that the bumps in the road that on a player's career, on their pathway from youth to senior level, they're not something to be feared. They're not something to be avoided, but they're actually something nearly to welcome so that so the players get a chance to develop, to, to grow new skills and to actually develop skills to get round obstacles so that when they get to the senior level, they've got that in their locker and they can use them if and when they need them. OK, so now we're going to have a look at maybe times when our resilience is challenged. Um, obviously, if, if I was doing this face to face, I would be asking the people in the room to come up with this. I've had a go at it myself. Um, so I've looked at some of the sporting, the times in sport when our resilience is challenged. Um, so obviously being dropped is a time when our, when our resilience can quite often be challenged. Not being selected for a team or a squad. Um, losing a big game. Criticism. Quite often it's very hard to escape criticism for young players now with the social media thing and you know discussion boards and, and, and different things like that. So that can be hard to deal with. Performing poorly in matches, making mistakes, getting injured, being substituted, adver general adversity or the pressure of, of big games overwhelming them. So that's that's times or that's examples when our resilience as players is challenged. The real life ones on top of the sporting ones, and um, that can be exam pressures, relationship problems, family problems, making bad choices or anxiety about the future. I think one of the, the things that I want to be really, really strong on, and I think it's important for parents and coaches to make very, very clear to their players. When you're playing competitive sport, regardless of what level, you know, there there is going to be adversity, there is going to be disappointments. It's it's part of it's part of the it's part of the package, you know. And when these things happen, you know, I think it's important for you as a parent or a coach to actually normalize these things. They do happen. They happen to it's it's not realistic to think that any player is going to get through their career and play well in every match or, you know, please the coach in everything they do. You know, so when 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 the when the player loses a big game, you know, performs poorly, gets injured, you know, doesn't perform well in a big game, you have to normalize that. It's not that's normal that that happens. But you know what what's not normal is allowing that as opposed to fester and allowing that to, to impact on future performances. And that maybe leads us into the next slide and um, the strategies to actually improve resilience. The, the four areas that we're going to look at, they, they might seem quite simple and they are simple, but they're quite effective. So these are strategies that you can use as a coach or as a parent to improve resilience in your young athletes. So the first thing is reframing and it may be to paraphrase that, it's just asking them to challenge the negative thoughts that they may have around a performance or around an event. And we're going to speak about that in a second, just around the, the whole area. I'm sure you're familiar with the, the whole area of growth mindset versus fixed mindset. The second area we're going to look at, OK, um, again, that's a kind of like, sounds like a very high tech thing. Basically, any young player playing sport, I suppose, at any level, needs somebody to have their back. They need somebody that they can trust, feel comfortable with, somebody that's going to tell them the, the, the truth and somebody that's going to advise them. The third area we're going to look at is modeling um, resilient behavior. Um, and really what that means, it's just trying to think of maybe somebody at a high level within your club or in your county and how they deal with adversity and trying to, to model that behavior within your own game. And finally, we'll have a look at what's called the, the control and influence model. So those are, those are the four strategies that we're going to look at. So reframing. We said there, reframing is the process of changing the way you view a situation or event. All right, so say, for example, a young player performs poorly. Negative self-talk can creep in. Okay. So something like, I'm no good at football. All right, so actually what they've done there is they've taken the poor performance personal and they've made it permanent. Okay, they've, they've They've just what's called a, I suppose, a, a fixed mindset. You know, I'm, ne I'm never going to get any better. That will flow through their performance until they, they take action. OK, so as a parent or as a coach, I would say, you know, if, if a player is constantly or your, your child or one of your players is constantly, you know, coming up with things like that, 
that's time to, to nip that in the bud. So, so what can you do? All right, you have a choice. You can either think like that, or you can have a fixed mindset, or sorry, a, a, a growth mindset, and ask yourself, okay, so why did I uh, perform poorly? What could I learn from that? And what can I do better the next time? Again, sounds very simple, but it can be very effective. Okay. Moving on, we, we talked about the, the, the fixed versus growth mindset. So the graphic, I suppose, um, illustrates the differences in the two. Quite often, and even, even athletes that are very successful, quite often they still have a fixed mindset. Okay, so they avoid challenges. They ignore um, feedback and critique. They believe that they're intelligent and their talent are fixed. So they'll never get any smarter around the game or they'll never get any more talented. Or they'll, you know, they'll never grow. Uh, they have less effort, they give up easily, they, they believe that they're a failure when things go wrong, they feel threatened by the success of others, and you know, they, they talk to themselves thinking about things like, you know, I'll never improve. The growth mindset, the player with the growth mindset, embraces a challenge, you know, actually welcomes it. They learn from feedback and critique. Their, their intelligence and talent can be developed. They believe that they can, they can grow in those things. They'll have more effort, they keep trying, they never give up. They persist in the face of setbacks. They're inspired by others. So instead of feeling threatened by others, they're inspired by others and they have a, an I will learn attitude. Okay. So we're not going to go any more detail into that. Um, what I will um, revert you to, the, the expert in this field is a lady called Dr. Carol Duick. And it's simply just a Google search and there's a, an, a, a range of stuff that Carol has done in this area. But if you want to expand your knowledge on it, that's what I that's what I would recommend. Okay, moving on, the support network. And as I said earlier, you know this sounds very highfalutin. Okay, a support uh, resilient people always have a support team of people that they trust and are secure with. They have an attachment to. So it could be a parent, it could be a coach, it could be a brother, an uncle, but somebody that. Somebody that that player can go to when, when they're down or when they've got a question and somebody that they know will give them, you know, a straight answer. In order to boost resilience, a young player must feel like they are exceptionally well supported. OK. And when faced with a significant obstacle or have been knocked down by a significant event, the support team are likely to manage the situation more effectively and recover faster. Now, one thing I want to be very clear on, OK. You've got to be straight with the players as well. OK, you can't avoid the hard conversations. Now, quite often, sometimes when, when a player comes home and the, they've had a bad performance, the natural reaction by a parent is to say, you know, it, it wasn't your fault. You know, you, you did well. It was the other 14 or the manager didn't make the right decisions or whatever. You know, I think as a coach, you the truth. You know, and I suppose the skill is how you do that. OK. So again, it's very, very important that young players feel supported as they're going through the, the pathway or going through the age grades. Moving on, number three is, is modeling resilient behavior. What we mean by that is, I think there's always role models, even in clubs at senior level, role models in counties, okay? Notice what already successful players do when met with adversity and alter it to suit your unique self. Um, and the other thing I suppose for parents, I'm a parent myself, you know, actions speak louder than words. Parents and coaches can say all the right words, but if you're not living things yourself, your players and children will notice. All right. So again, it, you know, we, we watch TV, you look at the, I mentioned Michael Murphy, I mentioned Conor McManus, guys like that. It looks very, it looks like it comes very, very simple to them. You know, but if you scratch the surface, you'll see those guys have to, I suppose, evolve all the time and they have to deal with adversity all the time. So again, I would encourage players or parents to, to, to study that. You know, again, going back to your club, if, if there's a senior player in your club that you've noticed is very resilient and bounces back very quickly from a, a bad defeat or whatever, you know, have a look at that. Try to study that, see what works for them and, and try to apply that to yourself. And lastly, we're going to come out, we're going to speak a little bit about the control and influence model. Basically, what, what this means is quite often young players give too much attention to things they can't control or can't influence. Okay, 
So the first one there, the bigger circle there is the concern circle or, or the control circle. We can't directly or indirectly affect this, so let's not focus on it. So that's something like where games being played. Quite often you'll hear players saying, oh, I never play well at this pitch or the weather, maybe something like that. You know, I never play well when it's wet. You know, you have no control. Influence. This is something that someone else in the in the organization or the team can control. Let them deal with this as a as a wider team. So quite often what can happen is players can start coaching when they're on the pitch. Okay. Sometimes the, the better players get frustrated. They get frustrated at their teammates. They get frustrated maybe at the coach because they see them playing the wrong tactics or are not playing the players in the right position. And um, I, I think a good analogy is this is, is the army. You know, the army, they've got generals for a reason and they've got soldiers for a reason. Um, the generals come up with the, the tactics in battle, okay, and it's the soldier's job to go out and execute that. And that's the way I see that in Gaelic games. You know, the, the managers come up with the tactics, the players, your sole job is to go out and execute that, okay? And somebody gave me a bit of advice one time um, around particularly players when they get to senior level or maybe an older age, if they're starting to coach while they're playing, it's probably about time that they actually stop playing and went into coaching because you can't put your full focus on two things. If you're focusing on coaching, if you're focusing too much on what other people are doing around you, you're not giving your full concentration to what you're doing. So I, th I think there's a bit of learning in that, in that as well. The last circle is the control circle, okay? And I would always encourage young players, this is where you live. This is where you invest all your time, what you can control. So you would ask yourself, what can, what is in my control? Okay, you always go back to the basics, you know, your fitness level. How could your fitness be better? Your skill level, you know, are, are my skill, is my skills good? You know, is my, you know, can my shooting be any better? Can my tackling be any better? And again, that's what I would encourage young players, you know, particularly young players who get frustrated. You know, what's in my control? What can I control or what can't I control? You know, sometimes with resilience, you, you hear about a, a really talented young player getting targeted or getting double marked. You know, quite often that's that's out of your control. You can't control that, but what, what you can control is, you, is your reaction to it. So that's, I suppose, that's the four areas of the four strategies that you can look at or develop as a player or as a parent or a coach, try to develop w within your sons or daughters. OK, I've got a video here. I'm hoping it plays. Um, I'm not going to speak too much about it. I think it really sums up, I suppose, what coaching is about. So I'll, I'll hit play here. Hopefully you can hear it. It's, it's for about, it lasts for about two minutes. And then I suppose we'll have a discussion about it whenever it's over. And now to honor America and salute the men and women serving our country with our national anthem. Please welcome, as voted by you, the fans, our winner of the Toyota Get the Feeling of a Star promotion, Natalie Gilbert. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proud The stars are stars. Stars light, last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fire o'er the rain. We watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rockets red and the gave proof through the night that our flag was 
Okay, so I suppose just to describe what, what was happening there in the video, the guy who came in to help the girls sing, he was, he was the coach of, of one of the teams that was playing. Okay, so it wasn't really even his role to come in there to help her out. But his coaching instincts, I suppose, came in on him. And he, he probably had a few choices. His first choice would have been to, to stay out of it. You know, just let the wee girl sink out there on her own. He, he probably had enough to worry about. That was one choice. Um, the second choice he could have did was he could have walked over there and said to her, you know, you're great. You know, nobody even noticed that you, you, you know, you forgot the words and told her to go on ahead in. Or the third thing, which is the thing that he did, was his coaching, in, his coaching instincts came in. So the first thing that he did was, you know, he, he, he had her back. He put his hand on her shoulder. OK, he didn't let her off the hook. You know, he, 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 he gave her what she needed. So basically what she needed was the words and a bit of support. So they got through it and eventually they got to the end of it. And, and again, that just said everything to me about, you know, our job as coaches. It's supporting the player. It's giving them what, what they need. It's not letting them off the hook. Sometimes you have to be strong with them, tell them the truth. But I just thought that that video just summed everything up that, I suppose, what sometimes our youth players need from us as coaches. Okay, so that's, I suppose that's us back to our learning outcomes. Hopefully now we've got a better idea of what, what resilience is. Okay, again, a, a term that's bonded about. Hopefully we know exactly what it means. We have identified times when our resilience is challenged, particularly for young people in sport. And hopefully you've got some strategies, some simple but very effective strategies that you can use with your players or your sons and daughters when those times come that, you know, when they need to show resilience. And again, you know, I would stress to you what I talked about at the start, the bumps on the road, the setbacks, the adversity, that's normal. That will come. That will come. And I think the smart people will it's not so much welcome them, but we'll accept them and we'll, you know, learn strategies or develop themselves in it to, to enable them to deal with those adversities and that will stand to them once they reach senior level. Whereas I suppose sometimes we talk about the, the snowplow parents and we, maybe we don't do it on purpose, but sometimes parents feel it's their instinct to clear all the obstacles out of the way for their sons or daughters. And the reality is that you're probably not helping them and, and then you're not allowing them any growth or you're not allowing them to develop any skills that, that, that they're going to need whenever they reach senior level. OK, just to finish off, um, th th there's a number of resources. Just I mentioned Anya McNamara. So again, a Google search, Anya McNamara, Developing Resilience in Young Players. There's a great video there, about 19 minutes long, um, around some work that she did with the, with the PFA. The growth mindset stuff that they the go-to there is Dr. Carol Duick, and again, a Google search will, will will get you there. And the video that we just watched is the coach's name is Mo Cheeks, and just if you go into YouTube, Mo Cheeks helps girls sing the national anthem. It, just before I, I maybe hand back to Paul, or before we take any questions, I just want to um, speak about a, a resource that we have at Ulster GA. It's the Performance and Lifestyle of the PALS program. Um, really, the idea behind it is that we've put together some resources to be used with, with young players by coaches or by parents. There's three separate areas. There's the performance skills, there's lifestyle, and there's player welfare. Um, as I said, there's, actually, you know, there's some good information there, but there's also some tools that you can use as a coach or as a, as a, a player or as a parent to actually improve your performance skills or, or, or your lifestyle or your, you know, if you're having any, any welfare issues. OK, so thanks very much for your time. I think I'm going to hand back to Paul and he's going to come in with with any questions. OK, good. Good man, Ryan. Uh, I suppose it's good that you put up the, the slide there with the, the YouTube because for some reason the sound didn't come in. I know we did the wee test just before we come on. The, okay. so, the, so, the sound didn't come in, but he explained it well okay. and people can go back in and, and view it themselves. So uh, it's just right. the way, way things work out. So okay. a couple of questions that come in there. OK, so uh, do you think resilience is worked on enough with children at schools or at home? No, I, def I don't. I definitely don't. Um, I think again, it's probably an area that we don't know enough about. You know, where people don't feel confident enough for how to approach it. Um, again, as a coach, I, I think you have so much other stuff on, on your mind as a coach. You know, you're trying to get players fit, or you're trying to get them, you know, their skill level, and you're trying to get tactics and and, and you know 
you have a lot to deal with. So I, I would say definitely if, uh, from a coaching point of view, you couldn't have enough people helping you. You know what I mean? And, and, and you know, giving them their, their own jobs and maybe freeing you up a wee bit more to, to, to work on things like resilience. But definitely, I suppose, at, at home and about uh, and at coaching sessions as well, I think it's it's important that you you start, I suppose, planting that seed with young people that you know it's not all going to be smooth sailing, and that it's actually quite normal for for the setbacks to to occur, and probably those setbacks can kind of stand to you in later life rather than the player that you know just gets through gets through their their pathway very easily. Okay, good stuff. Uh, any ideas uh, with? With games or results going against them, so how do you deal with any ideas or giving tips or any ideas if the results or games aren't going against aren't going against them? Yeah, and you know it, that's the reality. You know, quite often, you know, teams they don't have the resources. A club team could be quite weak compared to maybe some of the other teams. So it, it's you don't you, you, you can't win. You always can't win. You know what I mean? Because you don't have the same amount of players as are. That the other team has. So my recommendation would be to is to set smaller goals. Okay, but you know, can we concede a certain amount in the game, or can we score a certain amount in the game, or can we get you know a certain amount of tackles in? You know, and then I think really as a coach, the skill in that is celebrating those things whenever you know the players or the teams achieve them, rather than I think we hang too much on or we judge ourselves too much on winning and losing. You know, the reality is. Probably in any division, there's maybe only three, four teams can win it, and the, yeah. and the rest of them can't. But you know, you can't say that 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 those teams haven't been a success, or that those teams are failures just because they haven't won. So that would be my message: is to break it down into more achievable goals that 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 they, that they actually can achieve, and you know, celebrate those when they do achieve them. Okay. How do you develop res resilience in your physically stronger players who may feel under pressure to perform? Yeah, you see that all the time. You see um, a really good player, you know, and they start getting double marked or they start getting extra attention. And, you know, that is, I suppose the question is, it goes back to the control thing. What can you control and what can't you control? You know, you, you can't control the getting double teamed. You can't control the, the getting extra attention. But what you can control, you know, is your fitness levels, your skill levels, your, your preparation for that game. And sometimes, actually, you might have to adopt you know, spoke about, I suppose I've mentioned Michael Murphy's name quite a bit. You know, and Michael started off as a full forward and a really, really effective one, you know, one of the best. But then teams started, you know, really setting up to actually just counteract him. And you, you see now that he's had to adopt. He, often you can see him coming out to midfield or playing as a, as a playmaker. So again, that's maybe as parents or as coaches that we can make that point to our, maybe our more talented or stronger players. You know, you might have to think outside the box if you can't contribute in the way that you normally do. You know, think of ways where where, where you can contribute. Okay, good stuff. Uh, last question here. Uh, I suppose there's some some similar questions come in. There's two or three on the same line, so maybe that's the last question might cover all of them. How do you manage parents' reactions when you might be honest with players as to their performance where it needs to be proved to improve? So, how do you manage parents' reactions when you might be being honest with the players as to their performance? Where it may need to improve. I suppose you have to be. You have to be honest. I suppose it's all in the skill of how you do it. You know, I think you know. Again, you're you're going nowhere as a coach. You know, ignoring maybe a a, a child or a young player's weaknesses. You you know, you've got. I think the skill is you know how you explain that to them. I don't think it's a good idea ever to in front of a group ever to to point out somebody's. Weaknesses. I think yeah. it's always better to do it on a one-to-one -one because the minute you start doing it with a group, people start to you know the the, the feel uncomfortable and they start to, to shut off a bit. You know, yeah. so maybe I know we don't have a lot of time. Quite often, it can be hard maybe for young people to listen to actually what they're being told. But maybe if it's written down and they receive it in an email or a WhatsApp or whatever in a positive way, you know, maybe identify their their, their strengths, but then identify you know areas where they can they can improve on. Rather, rather than you know, you know, maybe just being blunt with them as such. Okay. Thanks very much, T. Ryan, and thanks for logging on. And I'm, I'm sure you'll be see you again shortly as we have a new numerous uh, webinar coming over the next few weeks. So thanks very much. Thank you.